All right. Ecosystems and energy. What's an ecosystem? Okay. Well, we got a hand over here. Though. Hold on one sec. Go ahead. All right. Add to that, uh, gentlemen. Okay. All right. And back there. Okay. Awesome. Um, all of that has a little bit of, of, of truth in it. Um, an ecosystem is, is smaller than the whole Earth. The Earth, you could say, has many ecosystems. Um, a little slice, I liked that. Uh, I like the, the handful of you said uh, you included the, the, the critters, the plants, um, the, the inorganic stuff as well, the rocks and the water. Okay, an ecosystem has all of that, so it's all these components, and you'll see a much more formal definition, I'm sure. Uh, but it's all these components um, that, that make up a particular, I hate to use another vocabulary word, but a particular environment. Okay, um, And you know, uh, hopefully just from your 20 some odd years on, on the planet, that there's a handful of different environments. Okay, you could even walk through a couple in a in a in a normal walk or in a drive. You could go through a couple different environments. Um, you're driving along the road and it's all farmers' fields, and then the next thing you know, you're surrounded by um, marsh or swamp on either side, and then you're back to fields again. All right, you just traveled through a different ecosystem or a different environment. I probably, even though there are differences, I probably use those words interchangeably. Okay, it's not the horriblest thing to do. So, a lot of these words have something in common, a, a prefix, if you would, and that's eco. All right. Um, so, we're going to talk briefly about ecology, which is obviously, hint, hint, related to ecosystems. Um, so, ecology is the study uh, of interactions between organisms, um, and much more so, I don't even know why we have two bullets here. Study of, I like the second bullet, um, I, I guess, I guess you could do one without the other, if someone was very narrow in their scope, pardon my back, you guys, it's been a year and a half since I've read these slides. Um, so, uh, you could have someone with a very narrow scope in their study that's really just worried about how uh, two uh, neighboring uh, groups of squirrels uh, fight, okay? Um, and you could be very narrow scope, and it's just between the organisms then. But uh, anyone that's taken even a single sight class would probably say, okay, well, what are the squirrels fighting about? And invariably, then you end up right into the environment, whether they're fighting over uh, nuts and berries or a particular tree, or a water source, all right, boom, you're right there in the environment. So um, I do think the uh, the second bullet there is probably the much more concise definition. Ernst Haeckel, um, pardon my German, not the best, but we're going to go with Haeckel. Um, Coin the term. Turns out eco means house. Who would have thunk? Ology is another one of those. Uh, logi, logos, is not a prefix per se, but certainly a word that you see an awful lot. You might be taking, I just mentioned psych, psychology, or biology, or sociology. You, you happen to notice they all ended in ology. That must be pretty important. Okay. So I, I, I coined the phrase Latin English many years ago. Um, logi, or, or more so ology, is, um, is, is Latin English for study of. Okay, So anytime you see that in there. And then one word we do have in English, logo, is kind of derived from, from there as well. It, it came to mean sort of an icon for something, a logo. Um, but uh, it, it has its root in there 
has as well. So the study of our house, and, and this goes back to, you know, Mother Earth, and we all live here, and so on and so forth. Now, the funny thing is, I remember writing these PowerPoints, reading the chapters myself, and, and figuring out what I wanted to pull out of them. Um, I knew Haeckel from, pardon me, uh, I have to take this, excuse me. So I, I think I was saying that I uh, was surprised when I read this myself. Um, I think I told you I have a, a paleontology background, uh, which is basically zoology of dead stuff. All right. And um, so I was familiar with Haeckel's work because he did all these cool um, line drawings, pencil drawings, if you would, of all kinds of uh, microorganisms and whatnot, way back, uh, woodcuts even, really. Um, uh, and his imprints have made their way into postcards and so on and so forth uh, over the years. So that's how I had known his name. Um, I just figured he was a zoologist or something like that. And, of course, that's not a bad background to, to go into ecology, of course. So, um, so yeah, Ernst Haeckel uh, does a lot of stuff in science for us. Uh, ah! Okay, there we are. So, um, before we can talk about an ecosystem proper, we have a few more vocabulary words to get across. And uh, two of those are population and community. What is the difference? All right. Um, so a population, a group of organisms of the same species, living in the same environment at the same time. That's population. So we talk about a, the squirrel population, okay, or the uh, population of Utica. They're not counting the squirrels, they're counting the, the people. All right? Population is specific. The community, though, is all of the different populations in a particular environment. So now we're talking about not just the squirrels, but the birds uh, and the humans. And I'm not a huge fan of botany, so I tend to focus on the critters all the time. But yes, the trees, the shrubs, the flowers, the grass, all of that can be part of the community. And if you're thinking, oh my God, you know, where does that end? It, it can be very large. And that's why sometimes people do need to narrow their scope and say, okay, we're only going to focus on these two warring tribes of squirrels or whatever. Um, I don't know where you guys live. I used to live in South Utica, and we had, for the last several years, a, um, oh, I don't know, a town, a town, someone we elected, a town official, town official, and she always sends out emails about the community, okay? And she talks about all the various different aspects of the community, um, the different neighborhoods is one way to think about it, I guess is where I was going with this, uh, all that make up a, a community. Okay, and as you know, different neighborhoods can often be um, different uh, in their the makeup of the houses or the makeup of the, the, the general population. There's lots of different things that go into it, um, but uh, I, I try not to focus on, on people too much. I told you guys uh, way back on day one that I like to talk about the forest, okay? But for those of you that, you know, not quite forest-oriented, uh, every so often I'll try to give you a humanistic example as well. So questions about the difference between population and community. All right, so finally the word ecosystem. The biotic interactions of a community as well as the interactions between organisms and their abiotic environment. Now, I, a couple of minutes ago, I just said if I give you a definition and you don't know a couple, a word or two in the definition, that definition isn't very horribly helpful now, is it? So here's a great example of that. What does abiotic mean? Uh, yes, ma'am. Non-living. Non-living, sir? All right. What does a mean as a prefix? Non, no, no. non not, no. Right. Atypical, anomaly. Uh, abysmal, well, no, not abysmal. 
Anaerobic, but, no oxygen. And, yeah, anaerobic means no oxygen. Sometimes you will see an N, that's a great point. So A is usually a negative, okay? So we've got biotic and abiotic. Biotic and not biotic. So the living and the non-living, okay? Um, and that's where the word physical environment kind of is, is synonymous there for abiotic. Uh, we're talking about the rocks, the water, nutrients. Um, I was going to say grass, but but grass is, uh, and, and this is where it gets tricky. Okay. The soil beneath the grass. Yeah, abiotic. that's a, thank you. That's a great example. So yeah, the soil. That's the word I was probably hunting for in my brain. I knew there was something else. So it really is the whole shebang. All right. So again, not just the squirrels, but the squirrels in the tree, squirrels in the food, and, and maybe that water source, and so on and so forth. And the nutrients. Squirrels aren't thinking about it with regard to the soil being nutrient rich, of course, but underneath it all, <laughs> no pun intended, uh, that's that's what it's all about. Got better berries, et cetera, et cetera. So again, just pointing this out, an, env uh, an environment, as I said, I use them kind of synonymously, um, has biotic and abiotic components to it. The biotic is the living plant, animal, fungi, bacteria. Bacteria are alive, folks, okay? Um, that's why your doctor can give you medicine to, to kill them. Antibiotic, there's that A again. Not on the slide, but for what it's worth, viruses, not alive. That's why it's really, really hard to, to kill viruses. Viruses are pieces, parts of code floating around. All right, and, and it's, it's a really funky um, sort of co-evolution going on with, with viruses. Um, but generally speaking, they're considered uh, not to be alive. Um, that's why if they, you go to the doctor and you think you got a really bad um, infection of some sort, and they're like, oh, well, I, I can't give you anything for it because it's a virus. That's why. And yeah, there's things out there called antivirals now, but they kind of like deconstruct the virus or make it um, block the receptors for it. They do a handful of things, but they don't, you can't kill it because it never was alive. Um, so the fungi, which are the, the mushrooms and molds and stuff like that, uh, the bacterium, the animals, and the, and the plants. All right, abiotic is the non-living. Um, space, uh, I we would probably do better to say atmosphere there, the air. Um, sunlight, can't forget the sunlight, the weather, the rocks, etc. And again, that's sort of an on, ongoing list. Um, I like atmosphere way better than space, but... I guess you could talk about, we might actually be talking about a delineation, you know, the, the forest, however much that's like one mile by three miles or whatever. That might have been what I was going for there. So, an ecosystem. And, and I have this in here because uh, of a couple things. One, it reminds us of something that we might not have even considered. It's not just the water, or this is just an example, but it, not just the fact that this environment has water, but it's saline, it's, it's, it's salt water versus fresh water, and that is a different environment, okay? Just as running water versus still water, a river versus a stream, I'm um, sorry, a river versus a lake or a pond is a different environment. Fresh water versus salty water is a different environment. And even there's levels of salinity. You could have brackish, which is uh, sort of in between. You could have, you know, the hypersaline uh, areas where it's really, really salty. Um, there, there's all kinds of variations there. All right, and because of that, you might get different kinds of plants that grow there. Uh, and because of that, you're going to get different kinds of critters that can eat said grass. I think somebody asked me the other day about the Shinka T ponies that I had on my uh, one of the opening slides. Okay, um, those those ponies have evolved over the years to be able to tolerate 
really, really salty grass. All right. Not a whole lot of things appreciate that. You give it to your horse over here in, in out in Westmoreland, and it's going to go, what the hell is this? This is nasty. All right. But those ponies, they can eat it. And the funny thing is, is that, you know how salt affects people too. It helps you retain water. All those little ponies have these great big pot bellies too because they retain water from all the salt. And when they sell them off at auction, they actually have to give you some of that grass, or I don't know if they turn it into a hay, what they do, but sort of to wean them off onto normal, onto normal feed. So, um, very, very specific, okay? Very specific. Something else on here, and it reminds me because I, I, I don't talk about this a whole lot at all. We will talk about nutrient cycling a little bit. But you see the oxygen coming out, the CO2 going in, right? You guys are aware of photosynthesis. Uh, I'm hoping uh, from previous classes you're aware of um, the role that green plants play in that. And uh, as a result, again, depending on what level you're looking at, micro, macro, etc., cetera, um, you might actually be concerned with the fact that uh, how much oxygen or, or lack thereof these plants are putting it back into your environment and how much the exhaling of all of your critters and the uh, CO2 generally speaking in the air uh, is going in to feed those plants and, and so on and so forth. So um, like I said it's you can get as close and specific as you want or you can back out as far as you want um, and, and study this at any any level any level. Again, it's a perfect example of where I just kind of take this kind of stuff for granted. This really is underneath it all what it's all about. Okay, I don't get this micro in my personal interests in life. It is all about energy transfer. Okay, um, you know energy uh, defined. You've had again, you've had this a couple times by now, hopefully as the capacity or the ability to do work. And you know probably that we use a capital letter E to e to substitute for the word energy because it's so long and tedious to spell out. Uh, but no, because it's for formulas usually. All right. um, and energy, when they talk about it in said formulas, or if you are big into, um, go back to the humans for a minute here, if you're big into um, taking care of your body and not even necessarily weightlifting or something like that, but you're looking at calories all the time and uh, how many calories did I take in? How many calories did I put out? I'm obviously uh, not one of those folks, but um, again, I do, I do kind of understand it. All right. Um, so you might even know the kilojoules and, and stuff like that in, in kcals, kilocalories. All right. Some of these words might look familiar. I am not going to be having you balance ecosystem budgets, okay? Don't worry about that. But again, these are the words that are going on in the background through everything that's going on. And if energy wasn't being transferred, none of this would be going on. All right, and that's what I mean. It's, it's, it's literally what's running the whole system. But we tend to never to think about that. But there are folks out there in charge of worrying about things like that. Okay, uh, what would be a great example? Let's say all of a sudden um, that one of, uh, any one of those important uh, vegetations there, okay, for whatever reason dies off. Yeah, you lost a species and you lost a species of plants, but more so you lost more than likely a food source for one of the critters. Or you've, well, in the sense that they're green plants, definitely. Uh, but for my example, all right, I'm trying to just keep a simple little food chain thing going on here. Um, you've lost some input energy into, into that system, okay? And you will see results down the way because of it. Uh, I think this shows up as a definition, uh, as a question on the test, all right? Um, 
one kilocalorie is the energy required to raise the temperature of one kilogram of water by one degree Celsius. That is one of those um, constants, they call them. Um, one of those uh, numbers you just kind of got to remember getting through a class like this. Yes, ma'am, you had a question. Great question. Um, heat is probably the easiest way to explain it for me. Again, this is not my realm, so to speak. But uh, heat is a great example of how hot or cold something is. That's a measure of its energy. Um, and I don't know to tell you that, uh, well, I guess here's the sort of the equation, all right? You could say that if something is 10 degrees Celsius, that it has um, that many uh, kilojoules uh, in it. But I, I don't know, again, the conversion factor. It would be like 40 something, right? So one yeah, there you go. Thank you. Um, it's more like an abstract. It's as much as like time is or something like that, yeah. I mean, it's, it's just a way we break stuff down to measure stuff. It's, it's definitely human made, yeah. Um, it's, a, it's a unit. It's no different than saying something is six inches or you're 19 years or whatever. It's a, it's a, it's a construct of measurement that we've made. Um, but yeah, you're very true, in that, and I didn't even see this down here, um, that one kcal is equal to um, 4.184 kilojoules. And kcals, again, is more food. Um, you don't see kcals on the boxes of uh, Twinkies. You're going to see regular calories, but it's they're connected as well. And again, this is definitely veering out of your book. This might have been something in the book that actually has an entire page that I said, Ooh, I don't want to go there. So, yes, ma'am. Um, this bottom one here? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so I, that's a great question. I give multiple choice tests. Um, and it's nice to be able to take multiple choice past vocabulary. Okay, here's a definition. Which of these four words is that definition? Um, sometimes I do write application level multiple choice questions. Um, as in, okay, we know this as a result, which of these is the correct answer? This is going to be a definition one. So I'm going to say which of the following words is defined as the amount of energy required to raise the temperature of water, one degree Celsius, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. No, yeah, it'd be one, yeah. A kcal, probably kcal. Yeah, good question. So yeah, there are multiple choice tests. I don't think, again, it's been a long time. Um, I think I taught this over COVID, and COVID was all online, so that was screwy. I don't think any of the tests are short answer. I'll certainly you know, have you guys give you a heads up on that so you could prep differently, but um, prepare for mostly multiple guessy kind of, of questions. Some of this stuff obviously lends itself to uh, you guys writing some sentences out, and then that often it benefits you. Um, you know, it's hard to break multi uh, evolution down into multiple choice questions, but um, sometimes teachers, you know, have to find a way. So, but yeah, prepare for that kind of stuff. Um, I would not, for this very first test, you will not be writing any definitions. Okay, put it that way. All right, awesome. So we were talking about measuring energy, and um, like I said, this is this is more along the, the level that I uh, try to keep things in here, and that's acknowledging the different kinds of energy, all right? And in, in these, you guys can um, probably think of any number of ways that, that it's measured. So chemical energy is the first type of energy um, stored in the chemical bonds of, of molecules. The easiest way to think about this, but by no means the only way, uh, is to go back to those, those Twinkies. All right, you probably never thought of a Twinkie as a battery, but it is. Is a carrot stick a better battery? Probably. Okay, but in the end, food is energy stored in stored in it. It's um, a word we'll probably get to potential energy. Remember kinetic versus potential energy? You've heard that before. Right? It's potential energy. Um, 
radiant energy. Uh, radiant energy is types of energy that travel uh, in waves. All right, that's the radiation part of it. Uh, the one you are most familiar with is solar energy. But even the radio, the television, um, those are also forms of, of radiant energy. It's a very, very long wave versus short wave. Uh, at some point, we're going to pull out uh, a, a, a spectrum, okay? I don't think it shows up now. But we do go into energy uh, a good bit more in depth. I'm pretty sure later in the semester I may prove myself a liar. And I am a liar here because I see the next uh, screen has Roy G. Viv on it. So. Um, so radiant energy and then thermal energy. Thermal energy is heat energy, okay? Um, as thermal might imply to you. Uh, neat thing to know about thermal energy is it flows from high to low. From high um, energy to low energy. Uh, that's one of the reasons we get burned when we touch something really, really, really hot. Right? Uh, that's also the reason radiators work and, and so on and so forth is, is because of this heat flow. So energy can be a lot of things, chemical, radiant or thermal, okay? Um, and this is, uh, again, I apologize for, for, for having this so far out of mind. Um, I, I might end up repeating myself later, but, but a great example of this is um, something I always talk about, a, uh, a bonfire, all right? So you've got a bonfire. Uh, what do you put in a, in a bonfire to make it work? What do you need? Wood, logs, right? All right, so let's go back a step. Those logs came from trees. Where did the trees come from? Seed plus water plus sunlight plus one more thing, nutrients. Every damn one of them things is energy, right? Energy comes into that tree. It transfers, transfers it all into becoming that tree. It lives its happy little tree life out. It falls over, it dies, you're out camping with your friends, you say, ooh, firewood, cool. You chop it up, you throw it in the fire. What do you get out of that fire? Heat, what else? Light, good, what else? It's the one that you forget usually. Smoke, gases, yeah. Another form of energy though. You got that one. Does it make any sound? Yeah, that's energy too. That snap, crackle, and pop is also energy. Now, a lot of that is lost, right? A lot of that just fritters off into the atmosphere, the heat especially. Some of it goes into you. The light goes into your retinas, goes into your brain. You process the whole thing. You actually see the light. The sound uh, gets absorbed by you as well. But we're going to talk about really just the heat transfer here. Okay, that goes into you. It helps keep your metabolism going, helps keep you running a little bit better, so on and so forth. And then you use that maybe for kinetic energy, for motion. So that goes back to the first law of thermodynamics right there. You neither create nor destroy energy. It just, it changes form to form. All right, and that stuff fritters off into the atmosphere, as we said, and it's absorbed by something somewhere, ideally. There is a net loss, right? Not all transactions are 100%. What's the efficiency of gasoline? You might not know the exact number, but somebody, our cars, you know, like, really great at that in combustion engines. Well, yeah, miles per gallon is a side, but even just, even just burning gasoline to make the car work. Yeah, I see a couple nods out there. Yeah, no, not really well. I don't know the number either. Um, it's somewhere, I'd say, about 50 or below percent of the energy lost. And if you want any evidence of that, just go touch your engine, how hot it is, Okay. Um, so not all exchanges are 100% efficient or effective, whatever you want to call it. It's always energy loss. And that's the second law of thermodynamics. That's the chaos, okay, that eventually a system will fall into, into disarray. Um, you got to keep putting energy into a system, which is why, well, we're really getting deep here, and why this will probably take us well into Tuesday. Which is why, okay, the squirrels and the leaves and everything need to fall once they die back into the soil to go back 
through the tree roots to make more berries, to make more squirrels. All right. And how we're kind of screwing that up by putting ourselves in these hermetically sealed little boxes. That's, we don't want to think about that. But you can think about farming, right? Where do we get all our produce from over here? Majority of our produce. Other, yeah, let's just say Florida or California, right? So there's these giant mega fields where they're growing all of this food to feed the country. All right? No way are all those extra spoiled berries and whatever, whatever, whatever going back into that soil. We're totally robbing the soil of, of, of what should be its residual nutrients. Okay, so they have to keep putting what in? Fertilizer and stuff like that. Okay, so it's all connected, man. It's crazy. Um, but it really is. It really is. Those old hippies were onto something. So just a moment to give you an example of, of that you're familiar with. Okay, we're going to talk about radiant energy. And um, radiant energy, as I said, comes in wavelengths. All shapes and sizes, well, they're mostly wave shaped, but definitely all sizes, all right? Um, as a general rule, the shorter the wavelengths, the less you want to do with it, okay? The longer the wavelengths, it, it's, it's okay. Um, for example, over here where it's shorter, you see, and they try to explain that, um, the left side versus the right side, the gamma rays, you don't want to mess with those. X-rays, you know, Not the technique. The well, even the technician runs and hides behind a lead wall, right? So, they're, 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 and they put, you know, they cover you up so you're not getting any extra radiation or anything like that. Um, ultraviolet, is that good for us? No, a little bit, a little bit, you know. But generally speaking, no, we don't want anything to do with that. And they'll sell you UV this protection, UV that protection. All right, it's all about sunscreen nowadays. I still call it suntan oil and people glare at me. No, it's sunscreen. Got to get rid of that sun. I'm Italian. I could, I could absorb some. I'm good. But uh, whatever. So we get into ultraviolet and then, whoa, what's this whole rainbow thing here? This is your visible light. All right. This is your visible light. It runs between 0.4 and 0.7. Anybody know what that little funky UM thing is? A mu yeah. Okay. But what, what's, the, what's the unit of... Micrometers, good. Micrometers, nope, micrometers, yeah. Um, so it's tiny. Let's just suffice it to say it's tiny. Uh, 0.4 to 0.7, that's a wavelength, okay? Um, and we talked the other day about why is the sky blue, and I told you that nitrogen molecules were just the right size, the bounce blue versus everything. That, that's where it's all about, okay? Anywho, after that, we got infrared. And you notice infrared comes after red. Ultraviolet comes before microwaves, radar, TVs, radio. All right? It's all energy. It's all energy. Do you know why we call it a microwave if it's bigger than a microwave? No. I don't, but I do remember um, people really freaking out about microwaves and the radiation that they leaked and so on and so forth. And it's, it's microwaves, at least nowadays, back in the 70s, yeah, we didn't have a whole lot of things binging microwaves around, but good God, they're everywhere now. So hopefully they were wrong and it's not, well, hopefully the people in charge were right and everyone that was worrying wasn't wrong, right? But, uh, but yeah, there's microwaves everywhere. Um, you're not actually cooking your food with with radiation and quotes, all right? It's just it's just wavelengths. Um, radiation and quotes is over any of the dangerous stuff. Can I say that? And it's not supposed to be. Now, how that all works, I can't. I, I couldn't even begin to explain, other than saying that those wavelengths move with the wavelengths of your chicken nuggets, and then you get your particles moving, and that gets them vibrating, and because uh, Molecular speed is temperature, and, and if we get your chicken nuggets vibrating at the right frequency, then they're warm. So, all right. I don't think, again, when we get the quiz up, I don't think there's a whole hell of a lot of question-wise about this stuff, but be, you know, kind of get a cursory knowledge of it.
So here again, uh, I dropped these words a couple minutes ago, potential and kinetic. Okay. These are probably the two um, delineations of energy that you came into this class uh, familiar with. Whether you grasped them a whole lot the first time through or not is another question, but you've definitely heard potential energy and kinetic energy. Okay. Um, potential energy is stored energy. Just think of potentially I could use this. Kinetic, kinesthesis, it's movement. Okay, kinetics is, is the study of movement. So um, you can almost think of these as potential energy is, is a noun, all right, and, and kinetic energy is, is the verb. Um, one, is, one is an object, so to speak, a battery is a great uh, way to think of potential energy. The uh, toy car that you put that battery into. Is, is the kinetic energy, okay? And basically you're just converting from one type uh, to another and energy is always lost. We, we talked about that already. Uh, in the case of the toy car, uh, it's your enjoyment, right? It's that battery making those tires move, making that car go around the driveway or your basement floor or whatever. That energy is lost. Eventually that battery will die or need recharged. So you'll see these, I don't think I, no, I did not put on here. You'll see PE and KE occasionally, um, capitals. Okay, that's just short for potential energy and kinetic energy. What time do we go to? 35? Okay, thank you. Talked about these. All right, already. So if you didn't write it down when I was talking about it, I had this at the end of my bonfire story a moment or three back. You've heard of the first law of thermodynamics um, by a couple of different names. Conservation of energy, conservation of mass or matter, all right? Um, what they argue is that at, at a certain level, energy, mass, and matter are all the, the same thing. Uh, e equals mc squared. Einstein's thing goes a long way towards uh, that. So you can't create or destroy en energy. Um, an interesting side effect of, of that is, uh, or implication of that, is that everything we currently have um, has always been energy-wise, molecule-wise, um, and has been since the Big Bang, and will be until whatever our, pro our, our demise is. Um, again, going back to the old hippies, we're all stardust, baby. Um, one of the, my favorite quotes from the 70s, you know, that, that is where the original energy came from, um, where the elements came from. Stars are elemental fusion factories. They make elements. Um, the Earth is elements. You are elements. Um, I'm not sure. Are you saying it's chemical argument? Uh, well, again, chemistry is definitely an underlying force. And, and like I said, it's not one of my favorite science, sciences by any means. But I have definitely earned a respect for it the, the longer I've, I've been on this side of the desk. Um, things are because of their chemistry. You know? uh, and and as, as I said, the physicists could probably argue that chemistry is because of physics. If it weren't for gravity and whatnot, then those molecules wouldn't stay together and they just split in hairs at that point. But um, at a level we could understand, you know, you're different than the tree outside the window because you have a different chemistry uh, than any given one of us. So, anywho, but, um, and then again, the second law of thermodynamics, um, sometimes they, they refer to as chaos. Um, there's another word that has jumped out of my head. Um, energy is, is always lost um, as heat. Uh, or other things to the environment. Um, what is the word I'm looking for here? Entropy. Thank you. 
Just going to add, and I knew Siri wouldn't know that one. Entropy, you may have heard of that. Um, so, that's what entropy means. You have to keep putting energy into the system. I think I gave you guys the other day, I don't know why I was talking about. I think you have to keep this. using what is not bonfire if you want it to keep going. Or there you go. Out. I, yep, I generally use, I think the other day I used the, uh, your, your bedroom, cleaning your bedroom as an example. Um, you have to keep putting energy into that system, that bedroom, in order to maintain it. Uh, you have to keep putting wood into the fire of the bedroom as well to keep it going. So um, that's because of the second law of thermodynamics. That's not the second law. But because of the second law, you have to keep maintaining that system uh, in order for it to keep going. So it's like the first law is kind of uplifting, and then the, the second law is a downer. All right, an organism uh, may absorb energy from the environment, uh, or it may give off energy to the environment, but the total environment is always energy constant, and it has been constant since the Big Bang. The exception to this of course, is what we just talked about, like, say, the, uh, the fruit farming and so on and so forth, okay? Or if for some reason um, you felt the need to go in and remove uh, all of the dead animals from um, your, your neighborhood forest and all of the leaves and take them and put them somewhere else. But as long as they stay in that system, the system energy remains constant. It's just different forms of. And if you're really paying attention, you're saying, wait a minute, how can it be constant if there's always some loss? You're right. Thank you for paying attention. That doesn't invalidate the definition. The physicists will say, yeah, we know. Just stick with us. An organism cannot create the energy it requires to live. It must capture it from the environment. This is really freaking neat because at one level because it it, it it basically talks about how life began all right um, plants what's in charge of um, photosynthesis in plants chloroplast all right some of you might know the word chlorophyll all right or you might know photosynthesis chloroplasts are the organelle which is a tiny little part of a cell, right? Uh, the organelle that's in charge of taking that sunlight and actually doing all that stuff you already knew. In animal cells, there is an analog to that. Anyone know what that is? You've heard of it, yeah, mito mitochondria, all right? Mitochondria are the energy plants for animal cells. The argument goes that originally, because they are the only things that can create energy, they were free living, for lack of a better word, at some point, and later incorporated into our cells as batteries, if you would. All right. So you'll see some, if you explore such things, you'll see articles out there about how, at some point in time, chloroplasts were free living things. And, and mitochondria uh, arguably could have been free-living things uh, as, as well. Um, and then later, through something called symbiosis, all right, uh, they were incorporated into cells, um, and the rest is history. Uh, we see a great example of that with uh, cyanobacteria, the first uh, life on the planet. Um, and it's a certain type of, uh, well, bacteria um, that creates oxygen because it has uh, chloroplasts in it and um, the bacteria is uh, anaerobic borrow a word from earlier it doesn't want the oxygen okay um, but it uh, so it expels it out uh, into the environment the uh, bacteria produces as part of its life cycle carbon dioxide which the chloroplasts love to eat that's the symbiosis there. Um, and then they provide, photosynthesis makes sugar, right? C6H1206, no, yeah, that's glucose. 
And um, bacteria love sugar. So they got a good thing going there. And that, again, arguably, is the first life on Earth. Um, the chloroplast and then getting incorporated into the thing. All right. I'm starting to see smoke coming out of some of your ears there, which means I'm overloading you. Um, so we will not start the second law right now. Uh, we are up to slide 14, uh, 12. No, we're up to slide 15 out of 40. I think if I quit getting uh, tangentiated so much on Tuesday, we should be able to wrap this up on Tuesday. So start prepping for your test to be Thursday, okay? If Tuesday comes and goes, and we're still talking about this, then we'll bump it to the following Tuesday. But um, I think we should be able to, to wrap it up by then.